This is The Right Approach. I'm J.W. Judge, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Barbara Hensky. This is a podcast for writers to learn more about the craft of writing as we explore a new topic every week. Our guest today is Laurie Fagan. She is a novelist who had been a journalist, transitioned into writing novels. Um, she has a podcast. She has done YouTube videos. She narrates her own fiction. And we have a lot to talk about. We're going to cram this all into a regular amount of time, although I think it could probably go much longer. And I think what we're going to start with is writing strong female characters. I know that, you know, the current environment lends itself to having an interest in this. And we have seen a, a I don't know if you'd call it a renaissance <laughs> in the last 10 or 15 years of really strong female characters you know there there have been movies and books like gone girl that have really I mean, certainly it existed before but have paved the way for really strong female characters and so i'm going to talk about uh, uh, listen i want to listen about what we can do <laughs> to exhibit that so uh go well and 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 really uh you know strong female characters uh, kind of started with the Sisters in Crime organization when they were mostly men writing fiction, mystery fiction, and women couldn't get a stronghold. And so once the women uh, with Sisters in Crime, I think, started, then that also helped, uh, you know, launch a lot of these women. And certainly today we're seeing a lot more, which I am thrilled with. But I, I feel very passionate about empowering other women and especially younger women as they're coming up. Um, it's it's something that I think we need to model also for other women uh, to show positive, ethical uh, characters uh, who work hard and mm -hmm. who maybe screw up you know, like everybody does. Um, I was part of an organization called Women in Communications way back then, started in the student chapter, moved into the professional chapters, was president of, of uh, one of the chapters but that group of women uh, really helped me in starting my first business, uh, my, my writing business called Word Painting, uh, just to get me going and encouraging and uh, uh, giving me the confidence uh, that I could do something like that. So, yes, I think we all need to reach back uh, a hand uh, to other women. Um, my uh, protagonist in my first series, uh, Behind the Mic Mysteries, is young radio reporter Lisa Powers, and I used to. I started off in radio, and uh, so she covers the crime beat for her Chandler, Arizona fictional radio station. That's where I live. But she uh, helps them, uh, helps police solve cold cases because they're short staffed and she's interested. And then because she's in this gritty crime world all, all, all day, she writes these campy murder mystery podcasts at night. Now she's kind of in her 20s. She's a little naive, um, but she's a hard worker and she wants to do well. And she she wants to uh, you know do the best story she can. Uh, oops, my apologies. I hit my, hit my uh, cable there. Sorry about that. Um, she really wants to work hard and do the best stories that she can. Um, she has a few love interests, but it's mostly a mystery with, uh, with these campy stories. Um, so in the podcast, so the podcast is one storyline. So we've got a mystery, we've got a cold case, and we've got a podcast through every... So there's a lot of stuff to, to watch. But one of my favorite characters, and I'm writing another short story about her right now, is um, she, her name is L.N. Payne. And she's a private investigator in the 1940s. And it's kind of film noir feel, if you will. And if I may, I'm going to read just a real quick section from the opening of the podcast portion for Fade Out, my first, uh, sorry, Dead Air, second book, and uh, where she is in her office and uh, somebody's at the door. Heavy footsteps plod up the wooden stairs approaching the office door. A hesitation, then a rapping on the glass, soft but urgent. Come in, I say. The door swings open, and a tall, dark, smolderingly handsome gent in expensive striped glad rags ankles in. 
He sees me behind my desk and swiftly removes his hat from his head, revealing dark, slightly wavy hair slicked back like a still ocean wave. I give him the up and down as he rolls his hat round and round in his long, manicured fingers. Uh, excuse me, ma'am, I'm looking for the private dick, a uh, detective, he jaws, pointing to the name on the glass, L.N. Payne, private investigator. You're looking at her, I say, for the tenth time this week, and it's only Tuesday. But wait, you're a dame, he stammers. Glad you noticed. Now, what's your story? Somebody stiffy at the track? Somebody tailing you? You want me to tail someone? Wait a minute. What do you take me for, a patsy? A broad can't be a P.I. Oh, yeah? Why not, big guy? We broads got a few bulges most gum shoes don't, and I ain't talking about no cup size. With that, I swivel my chair and slowly cross my right leg over my left, letting my skirt reveal just a tiny bit of my thigh holster and the Remington over under 41 Derringer with a heck of a kick. He checks out my gams and his eyes get wide like a pair of 41 Packard Super Hubcaps. Yeah, I'm packing heat. Let me buy you a drink. I pour scotch neat into two glasses and hand one to him. Now, either be square with me or fade. Yeah, I think that so does a really good job. Yeah. yeah, of setting. Like, yes. You know the time frame by the language they're using, by mm -hmm. her references. Um, she's obviously in a field that is dominated by men. And so she has to establish her authority and, and get him in line mm -hmm. or out the door. I think that does a really good job of yeah. doing those things. Right, right. So, so she's been she's great fun to work uh, to write. I, I'm starting a new yes. uh, a new series, hopefully behind the lens mysteries about a television reporter photographer, and uh, T J Banks is uh, another very tough female character current day, um, where Lisa Powers is plays by the rules and follows the laws. TJ, not so much. She kind of skirts the laws and kind of wangles around a few things. Um, she covers uh, uh, major crimes and traumatic incidents, but her personal passion is to stamp out sex traffickers. So there's a lot uh, going on in, in those as well. But but again, I think the more uh, female characters we have, whether they're written by male or women, doesn't matter, I think the better. And I, I just think that's something that uh, again, I think a lot of women are I, predominantly the readers of mysteries. I, I believe that's pretty accurate, right? Sure. And so uh, I, I think, again, we women want to read about other strong, you know, women as well. So Lori, let me thank you for indulging. You. Yeah, you write great and interesting characters. Um, and you know your characters well, obviously. So do you ever have a character that that kind of takes over your storyline when you didn't expect it to? But for, for you know, they're fictional people and they're all from our imagination, but it's just odd because sometimes they just get out of control. I know Jeremy's had one in his first book. Uh, the main character got kind of gently kicked aside and somebody else took, took center stage. Have you had that happen? Isn't that amazing how that happens? Absolutely. I mean, now I'm I'm an outliner, so I I follow outlines and make outlines. I I use the uh, uh, there's a Save the Cat, which was a book written for screenwriters, and they've adapted it to novels. Save the Cat for novels, mm -hmm. and it is fabulous. And I I my last couple I've used that and found it very helpful. However, my characters will come along and say, "Oh no, I don't want to do that." I go. No, 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 no. Yeah, that's what's in the outline. No, sorry, I want to go here. Oh, all right. And so you let him go, and I'll be darned if it's not usually better, too. Mm. So that's what's kind of spooky, you know, to be. But absolutely, and like I say, it's all within this these brains of ours, I guess. But it is very interesting, I think, how that does happen. And how, how again, I think because you do get to know them very well, um, and they get to know you as well, that they know that they can kind of worm their way in and change the outline if, if they need to. 
So what are things that we want to avoid when writing female characters to make sure that they aren't flat or to make sure that we are not perpetrating stereotypes that are hurtful? And all the tropes that are out there, right. Um, oh, good, good question. I think that um, they can't be perfect, obviously. You've got to have foibles. You've got to have some flaws. Um, I do use a, a character um, kind of a description, uh, a Bible, that, if you will, because I can't remember. What kind of eyes did I give her, you know, as um, I'm going along? Yeah. So I keep yeah. that in a file. Yeah. So I can go back and refer to it. But, um, uh, you know, uh, certainly not that, it, not that they have to be on uh, arm candy for some guy or that they can't do certain things just because they're a woman. Um, and uh, again, that they can't be perfect. And, and yes, they will make mistakes. And yes, they will do things that maybe the reader doesn't like. But that's who we all are. We're all human, you know, in that respect, too. So um, I, I, I think that's a, something that everybody needs to uh, look closely at uh, when you're when you're reading those characters and make sure you don't fall into those, you know, those little traps of, well, this is what's always been done or this is how other people do it. And keep it fresh. Keep it interesting and keep it. I mean, I, I uh, with Ella, uh, with Lisa Powers, uh, she covers the Chandler radio station. So. She's confined pretty much to Arizona is, is all. TJ Banks, I can send her around the world, literally, and I am. And uh, just finding ways to get them into trouble is, uh, is a challenge half the time. And then how are they going to get out of that, you know, is another big challenge. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I think something that, that we have to make sure that we don't fall into those tropes and those uh, stereotypes. You know, you mentioned that one of my least favorite stereotypes is the emotional woman, the over-emotional woman. I know a very few women who face with a crisis break down into tears. No, we don't. We just put our boots on and get moving. So um, right. I'm very sensitive to people who write yeah. that in. No. And, yeah. and there's uh, um, there, my, my character, too. Uh, and I, I'm in a critique group, group, and they are fabulous women mystery thriller suspense writers and we have helped each other we read each other's things and critique and, and they really are our first readers too um but they're always telling me laura you need to show more emotion your character needs to show and you know i'm i'm i come from the television news world primarily where you get a minute 30 to write the story so i write tight i write i pack it in you know and so for me to add these oh you know if I read one more time about her gut clenched or, you know, she, you know, all these different emotions that are out there, so, oh, that's not really me. I feel like I need to include some of those if they're appropriate. I try not to overdo it. And, and, but you do, you read a lot of that. Every other line is some, you know, some emotion as she wiped a tear or, you know, whatever it is. So, uh, in, in, in some places, it works great. Um, for mm -hmm. me, it's a little challenging. I always have to add that. So my wife is a nurse at the Children's Hospital in Birmingham here, and she's in one of the critical care units. And Ooh. whether it's at work, and I don't get to see her at work, but you know, I know who she is and you know the stories she tells. So whether it's at work or whether it's at home, when things get real and there's some sort of crisis, she is, she does, she will not admit this about herself, but she like handles business. That is when she is her most level and in control. And if she needs to have a come apart afterwards, whenever all the dust has settled, then fine. But in that moment of crisis, she is, she never fails to be on point. Wow, that's great. And that probably helps you write your female characters. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and in fact, one of I used to teach high school before I went to law school and started practicing law. Oh. And one of my former students emailed me when she was reading my first book and said, I can't help but picture Anna when I am reading this character. Wow. And that's because, you know, a lot of it was just like, based on 
Now, there's a whole lot of differences, but there's also some similarities there. And, and they, knowing her, you know, could see that. So, yeah, it definitely plays into that. Um, That's great. So we live in a world where, on paper, there is much more equality and opportunity for women than there has been. I, I don't want to say that, you know, all of the glass ceilings are broken or anything like that. Cause that's just not true. So on paper, I think there is a lot more opportunity. And I think in reality, there is a lot more opportunity, yeah. but, and I think this is probably a question for both of y'all. Um, you know, you're writing female characters, Barbara, you're writing women's fiction. How much do you focus on, you know, breaking that glass ceiling and opportunities and challenges versus showing women in particular roles and treating it as I'm trying to figure out even the best way to ask it, treating that as this is normal now and this is how we do business and mm -hmm. these are our opportunities and it's what we're doing. How how do you and I guess it's going to be different writing something in the 1940s than set present day. Um but where do you balance that? Well and I think that I balance a lot of it from what my perspective is or was, you know, uh, coming up in the 70s. Women could do a lot of different things that they couldn't, you know, before that. And so I think back to some of those days to say, okay, let's push that. Let's push it. I guess that's probably the main thing. I'm always trying to push it. Okay, well, this is where we are now, but let's push it up here a little bit more. Let's see if we can get her uh, not to just, you know, go to this country, but let's have her, you know, take down this big national, international uh, sex trafficker, you know. So I, I think, like you said, it's not reality necessarily yet, uh, but we can create the illusion that it could be reality maybe someday. Barbara, what do you think? Yeah, I do both. I My Rosemont series writes as if all of this stuff with women is is what happens. And my main character is a forensic accountant. And so she um, does a lot of high level professional jobs and things. My Rosemont series is one where I'm trying to um, affect societal change. Not my Rosemont series, my Guiding Emily series. Societal change, particularly in the attitude of the sighted community towards blind people. My protagonist is a blind woman. And I'm trying to address the isolation that the blind feel within the sighted community and um, not being seen as a burden, particularly to employers, because um, unemployment is shockingly high in among blind adults who are capable of holding down jobs. So I've got a little bit of a mix. In that, but I do think, and in in your first yeah. series, in your first guiding Emily, she's not seen even by her husband, right? I and mean, she's invisible to a lot of people, and I found that very interesting. Uh, yeah, I really felt for her and the problem she was going through. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting in my research. Um, the divorce rate among newly blind adults is extraordinarily high, and there are a lot of families oh. who just like, oh, you're not really blind, huh? What? That's just so dysfunctional. Wow. But anyway, I want to, if we can, there's a question I want to make sure we get to, because I want to hear your answer. So if I can segue, um, because you were a newspaper reporter and you rip real storylines from the headlines and you fictionalize them. Yeah. So how do you do that? Which ones are based on reality? I'm sure your trafficking one is based on reality. Um, and the, the trafficking, trafficking one is based on a kind of a, and they really all are kind of a combination sometimes of a few different stories too. Um, I started off in radio, uh, moved into television news, went into cable television news, and then kind of came full circle and was a print reporter and publisher uh, uh, towards the end of my career. Um, but specifically in uh, my television reporting days, I actually covered a story from uh, Northeastern Iowa of uh, a guy who two officers who were uh, called to this house uh, because of loud music. And this guy grabbed a gun, shot them both, killed them, 
fled into the cornfields of Iowa for a week before they found him. Then he went on trial. I covered that whole story there. I covered the trial, which was moved on a change of venue across the state uh, for a couple of weeks. And I kept all of my notes thinking someday I'd love to write something about this. So I I, I even had, I even have cue cards from my stand-ups that I did during the trial. I can, I even have the wanted poster from mm-hmm. from the guy who is since deceased now, but this was a wanted poster that they uh, put out at that time. So I'm so glad I kept it because in books two and three, uh, Dead Air and Bleeder of my uh, first Behind the Mic Mystery series, mm-hmm. I I use that story. Chandler has cornfields, not as many anymore, but we have some cornfields. So I just transported the story here fictionalize the area fictionalize the it's a it's an actual street in downtown channel but i changed the actual number and all that made sure that that wasn't a real house um mm-hmm. in the in the story spoiler alert uh lisa gets held hostage by the the guy um that didn't happen so obviously i fictionalize you know, a, a lot of that but the, the basis of the story i was able to put uh, right here uh, down to some of the details, including how they built, uh, and this actually happened, they built the same porch from this house in the courtroom in Iowa. So in my story, I have them build a court, the, the porch in the courtroom, and it becomes kind of a character itself in the story. And uh, so it, it, I, I used some actual lines from some of the characters as well from my trial notes and everything. Um, uh, there's another story uh, of a missing man and uh, the police think, well, you know, he's he's taken off because he had financial problems or whatever. And his daughter is adamant that, no, he wouldn't do that. And uh, turns out he had a car accident and wasn't found for several days. And that was ripped out of the headlines in Green, California, fictionalized, uh, made it happen in uh, in Arizona. And uh so just to take a, a, a gem uh, of something. Um, now, I also have some organizations that, yeah, I could change the name of the Find Me organization that has volunteers who go out and search for missing people. But, you know, I want to give props to them. I want to give them a little shout out. And so I make a note in, in my acknowledgments to to say, this is a real organization. Here's their URL because they do good work. And uh, the the uh, 100 Club uh, to give uh, funds to uh, police, uh, firefighters, law enforcement, and their families when they've had a, a you know traumatic accident or death or whatever. It's a it's a wonderful group who does great work. And again, I I mention them. We I have a whole storyline uh, uh, w- with that as well. And I I just kept the name of it. I got approval. I made a donation to them as well. Uh, uh, to do that, and uh, to me, it just it I, I'd ra- I, I'd rather do that than just make make something up in that sense. Mm-hmm. So, so ripping from the headlines, and, and especially since I, you know, have worked in that field so much too, is uh, is a fun way uh, uh, to tell a story. Anyway, yeah. So you've worked in several different types of journalism media, right? You have mm-hmm. mentioned how you tend to tell tight stories that move quickly. Are there other ways that your journalism career has directly affected your manner of storytelling or the way that you write your books? Well, and it was interesting. One of my first reviews I got from another fellow journalist said, you've always been a good storyteller in news and now you're taking that into fiction. And I was so kind of taken back by that i never really considered myself a storyteller per se i mean i I mean for instance i never thought i could write fiction i had written news for so long got to tell the truth the facts nothing but and i thought well there's no way that i could you know make this stuff up and uh, then i found how freeing that is to make stuff up so then then it really you know launched from there but i do think that uh, so much of what I did and, and and why, you know, that old thing, right, what you know, um, I know radio, I know television, 
Um, I don't know if I'll write about a print report, but maybe uh, Hank Filippi Ryan's doing a good job of that too. But um, but I, I feel like it, it. There's a lot that comes in. It's that internal knowledge, you know, that that you just got that uh, uh, helps then to give the background. I get a lot of people who say, "Boy, really now I know a lot more about what it's like to be uh, kind of behind the scenes of a radio reporter." You know, because I do a lot of details about the editing and different elements of that. And uh, now I, I had to update that a little bit because when I did it, it was a few years ago. Uh, but, you know, I've got friends in the industry yet, so I was able to take a tour of a new radio station and see how they really do things today. Um, but I do think there is something that uh, uh, comes internally then that I managed to, to create that and, and make it seem realistic. Uh, tell tell a good story, m you know, beginning, middle, end, all that type of thing. Sound bites are always important in radio and television. Uh, and to have somebody else's sound bite, to have their words interspersed, you know, with uh, the narrative um, is something I love to do anyway and did a lot as a reporter. And uh, and so I do. A, I, I've also been told I write really good dialogue. And that's something I really enjoy doing is writing uh, the dialogue for my characters and having them each have their own voice, each have their own, you know, little quirks and that type of thing, which I think is important too. So when you're giving the inside baseball of a radio station and editing, editing and how all that works, is that pertinent to the story or the plot? Or is that something you do to just add color and context? It's mostly for color and context, really. I mean, there's a few times when, you know, she's got to get this story written and it's late at night and she's on deadline and, you know, the pressure of that uh, becomes part of the story, you know, as well. So uh, so there is a, a combination of that, uh, too. But um, I, I do think it just kind of adds a little more uh, fullness, a little more depth uh, to her as a character, uh, to the book as a whole. Uh, to the, uh, again, just to the storyline, uh, to know that that you just don't go out there and stand up and, and say something, you know, you got to do some research, you got to uh, do interviews and, and that type of thing too. So um, I, I try to have a, a variety of ways that she does these internal uh, things uh, to show some of them, not everything, not all the time, you know, on the screen, but um, I even write uh, the, the voiceover. So you'll see the actual script sometime, the voiceover uh, announcer lead in. And Lisa Powers covers it for, for KWLF uh, News. And then uh, you see, so sometimes the script, sometimes she's live. Uh, so there's a variety of ways that I'm able to tell that too. Yeah. And I think it's that kind of specificity that makes it the world feel lived in and not like it's mm -hmm. a prop. And gives readers that just sense of immersion into these are people who existed before the story started and will exist after. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think that's really important. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I always like to end the show on a really practical note like that. So, before we go, tell people where I know you have a podcast that we didn't even get to that. Um, tell people it's relatively new it started in January. Tell people yeah. about the podcast where they can find your books and where they can learn more about you. Sure. Thank you so much. So it's, um, uh, my podcast is murder in the air mystery theater and it's on all podcast platforms where you ever, you listen to podcasts, just like this one. And I am interviewing authors who are mystery suspense or thriller, uh, uh authors who uh, we chat a little bit about their writing process and that type of thing. And then they read from their uh, piece. And then in between, I sprinkle in some of my audiobook podcast portions um, where I actually took actors into the studio to, re to uh, record those podcasts, fictional ones that they are, uh, for my audiobooks. And we did live sound effects. And uh, Jeremy, you were talking earlier about the challenges of doing narrating your own audiobooks and and the whole production thing of that. I'm very fortunate to have a very talented son who is an audio video content creator, and so he does all the mixing and mastering of my uh, audiobooks and my podcast. I do the general editing 
And then I'll say, okay, can you tighten up this edit? Or there's a noise over here. Can you, you get rid of it? Because he's got a lot more magic and gizmos in his world than I do. Um, so I'm very lucky in that regard to have somebody because not everybody does. And you're right. It is challenging to do that, uh, that type of a, a, a project. But I've got 16 episodes. They're, they're dropping every week right now through May. And then uh, go on a little hiatus, do more interviews over the summer, and uh, pick up another 16 episodes in the fall. And uh, I have a couple of uh, short stories that I'm that I will read as well. And uh, in fact, one of them got an honorable mention in an Arizona uh, Mystery Writers uh, Organization uh, competition. So that one's called Three Strikes, <clears throat> and that will be episode nine uh, coming up in March. Um, and then, uh, oh, I also had a, a short story accepted into the Los Angeles uh, Sisters in Crime anthology called Entertainment to Die For. And um, my story is uh, Mystery in MB, which stands for Manhattan Beach, because they all had to be centered in, in the L.A. area. And it's about a, a woman stalking a script writer. So um, <clears throat> then I'm going to I'm heading off to Left Coast Crime next uh, month. I'll be on a panel about uh, journalism, in fact, and we'll talk a lot about, so we talked about before that transition from, you know, journalist to novelist. And, uh, but uh, my website is readlauriefagan.com. And uh, you could, there's a link, uh, there's a tab for the podcast and you can see all the links there where you can see it and whatever and, and more information than you'd ever want to know about, uh, about me on uh, readlauriefagan.com. So, well, and thank I want to so thank much. you guys. Well, yeah, I want to well, thank you too, also for for doing this podcast. I mean, I got to tell you, <clears throat> I've learned so much um, uh, just uh, hearing about uh, how uh, Barb, how you work with uh, Lyndon Gross, and uh, and then when you had uh, Robert Dagoni, am I saying that right? On, yes, I yeah. immediately went out and bought his um, extraordinary life of Sam Hill. Oh my gosh, what a wonderful story that was. And then I've read two of the Tracy Cross White uh, mystery series as well. So thank you for all of your help that you do for writers. Well, and, and thank you so much for your time and insights. And Barbara, I just stepped all over you there. No, I just wanted to say no. your books are available on Amazon and wherever books are yep. sold. Is that right? Everybody right. can find you. Yes. All right. 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 Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.